بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهديه الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد This week we're on the chapter from Kitab Al-Tawheed The chapter Babu Qawlillahi Ta'ala Innaka la tahdi man ahbabt The chapter regarding the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In the Quran That you cannot guide whom you love Meaning that the guidance isn't in your control You cannot guide That's not something which is in your power To be able to guide whoever you want to guide so what does this chapter mean and what does this ayah mean? That's what the Shaykh is going to explain now uh, with some narrations and some explanation from a Shaykh Al-Fawzan, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. The purpose of this chapter, as the Shaykh mentions, is الرد على الذين غلوا في النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. It is to refute those people who have gone into extremism with regards to the Prophet sallallahu Some people, they go to an extreme with regards to, as they claim, their love for the Prophet sallallahu so much so that they begin attributing to the Prophet sallallahu things which have not been attributed to him. So they begin to say that he knew the unseen, for example. They begin to say that he had ability, power, to control whoever was going to be guided and who wasn't going to be guided. That the Prophet ﷺ had the ability to do all of that. So here the Shaykh is going to explain that this is not our aqidah. We do not go into exaggeration or extremism with regards to the Prophet ﷺ or any other Prophet or Messenger or from the righteous. So it is a refutation of the people now as you will see uh, throughout this chapter. Those people who exaggerate with regards to the Prophet ﷺ and go over and above what Allah and the Messenger have taught us. وَعَلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ الَّذِينَ يَتَعَلَّقُونَ بِالْأَوْلِيَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ And similarly, it will be a refutation of the mushrikeen, those individuals who were attached to the awliya as they claimed and the deceased in their graves and they were making dua to them, calling upon others besides Allah. This is all a refutation of them. How is that so? Here now we will see from this first narration. The hadith which is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Narrated, An ibn al-Musayyib, An abihi qal, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Ibn Hazan, Ibn Abi Wahab al-Makhzumi, One of the major senior tabi'een. One of the senior tabi'een, meaning there was the companions, and then the generation after the companions, the students of the companions, from amongst them, the tabi'een, this individual, Sa'id bin Musayyib, was from the senior of that level of that generation, from the tabi'een, who narrates this particular hadith. He says, uh, from his father, he narrates from his father, narrates from his father, uh, who was a companion, he says that the Prophet وسلم, or regarding this incident, Lama Hadarat Aba Talib al Wafa. He says, when death came to Abu Talib, when Abu Talib was on his deathbed, Abu Talib, as you know, the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, he was the uncle of the Prophet, وسلم, the son of Abdul Muttalib the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was the one who looked after the Prophet ﷺ after who died. When the Prophet ﷺ, his parents died, who looked after him first? But who looked after him from his own family first? His grandfather. The grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, he was the one who looked after the Prophet ﷺ first. When he died, then who took over the responsibility of looking after the Prophet ﷺ? Abu Talib, his uncle. So Abu Talib looked after the Prophet ﷺ, he took him in, 
as it's mentioned, as one of his own children, and the Prophet ﷺ grew up in the in the household with the family, etc. So he looked after the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Talib was with the Prophet ﷺ, even before the Prophet ﷺ became a Prophet, obviously he was his uncle. So he was with the Prophet ﷺ from that early time, and even after Muhammad ﷺ became a Prophet, Abu Talib stuck with him. Even though Abu Talib was... A mushrik, a disbeliever. But he stayed with the Prophet ﷺ. He carried on with him. Carried on defending him, protecting him, helping him. Even after the Prophet ﷺ came now with the prophethood. He was given the prophethood. Given the revelation. He carried on with him. فَبَقِيَ أَبُوْ طَالِبْ حَوْلَ الرَّسُولِ صلى الله عليه وسلم قَبْلَ الْبِعْثَ وَبَعْدَ الْبِعْثَ يُدَافِعُ عَنْهُ وَيَحْمِيهِ So Abu Talib was with the Prophet ﷺ. From that early age, even before the prophethood, and he carried on and stuck with him and stayed with him. Even after the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, even though Abu Talib himself was not a Muslim, he carried on with the Prophet ﷺ, defending him and protecting him. إِلَىٰ سَنَةْ ثَمَانْ مِنَ الْبِعْثَةِ Up to the eighth year of prophethood. Eight years after the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, for those first eight years, Abu Talib was with him all the way. Lam yufariqhu. He did not leave the Prophet ﷺ. Carried on defending him and protecting him from the harm that was coming to the Prophet ﷺ from the mushrikeen. وَيَصْبِرْ مَعَهُ عَلَى مُضَايَقَاتِ mushrikeen. And Abu Talib, he would remain patient upon the difficulties that the mushrikeen were putting upon them. The mushrikeen... They were oppressing the Prophet ﷺ. They were doing whatever they could do of their severity against the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Talib was trying to help the Prophet ﷺ to defend him, to protect him against all of that hardship and oppression that was coming from the mushrikeen. As a consequence, Abu Talib himself ended up facing that harm too, because he was with the Prophet ﷺ trying to protect him. So the mushrikeen were harming them. And he was therefore also taking in the harm. He was therefore also having to take the burden of the harm coming to him. Because he was with the Prophet ﷺ. So when the harm was coming to the Prophet ﷺ, it was coming upon him. So he took all of that and he was patient upon that with the Prophet ﷺ. So obviously the Prophet ﷺ was very keen that Abu Talib should accept Islam and become a Muslim. He was doing all of this, protecting him, defending him, even being harmed by the mushrikeen himself, even though Abu Talib himself was a mushrik. He was a mushrik himself, and he was being harmed by the other mushrikeen, because he was defending the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ was keen and enthusiastic. He really wanted him to accept Islam and become a Muslim. He was doing all of this good in that way anyway. So the Prophet ﷺ, genuinely, he had this uh, 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 zeal or enthusiasm for Abu Talib to accept Islam. Hoping that maybe Allah will then save Abu Talib from the fire if he accepts Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ was keen upon Abu Talib accepting Islam. Up until the moment when death approached Abu Talib. He was on his deathbed in his final moments of life. And the Prophet ﷺ carried on trying his best to make Abu Talib accept Islam. Up to the moment of his deathbed. So it says in the narration, لَمَّا حَضَرَتْ أَبَى طَالِبِ الْوَفَا When death came upon Abu Talib, جَاءَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم the Prophet ﷺ came to him, came to his own uncle, Abu Talib. وَعِنْدَهُ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ إِبْنْ أَبِي أُمَيَّةِ وَأَبُو جَهْلِ When the Prophet ﷺ came to Abu Talib, and Abu Talib was on his deathbed now, the Prophet ﷺ came and he noticed, he realized, he discovered that two of the mushrikeen were already there at the deathbed with Abu Talib already. Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah and Abu Jahl. They were already there at the deathbed with Abu Talib. When he arrived, he saw them already there. And these two individuals, 
obviously they were at that time both of them from the mushrikeen even though later Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah accepted Islam Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah and Abu Jahl were with Abu Talib when Abu Talib died afterwards Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah later on Allah blessed him he did become Muslim he accepted Islam so these two were there at that time both of them were mushrikeen of course these two were there and Abu Jahl, of course, he was from the most severe of the people upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was from the most severe of the people who harmed and tried to harm the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to the extent that it was even said about Abu Jahl that he is the Pharaoh of this Ummah. Abu Jahl, it was said about him that he is Fir'aun hadhi al-Ummah. That Abu Jahl, how severe he was against Islam and the Prophet ﷺ, it was mentioned that he is the Pharaoh of this Ummah. Just like Pharaoh was against the Musa ﷺ, Abu Jahl was against the Prophet ﷺ. And he was killed when? When was Abu Jahl killed? In the Battle of Badr. Abu Jahl was killed in the Battle of Badr. And he was from the leaders of the Mushrikeen on that day. He was from their heads, their commanders, their leaders. Uh, he was the one leading the army that day and encouraging everybody to come and fight against the Prophet ﷺ. So when the Prophet ﷺ went to his uncle on his deathbed to try to still give him da'wah, he saw that these two mushrikeen are already there. So then the Prophet ﷺ did what he went there to do. He gave da'wah to his uncle even at that last stage to still come to Islam because it's still okay, there's still time. The hadith says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْبَلُ تَوْبَةَ الْعَبْدِ مَا لَمْ يُغَرْغِرْ the hadith in Muslim that Allah will accept the tawbah, the repentance of a person, as long as the soul does not reach the neck, i.e. the soul is not exiting, before the exit of that soul, before it reaches the point of exit, then tawbah is accepted. Only when it reaches the point of exit, thereafter, after that tawbah cannot be accepted. So, he had not reached that stage yet. He had not reached the stage where the soul was at the point, at the verge of exit. He was on his deathbed, but he was alive yet. So the Prophet ﷺ went to give him da'wah. And so he said to him, Ya Am, O oh my uncle, Ya Am, O oh my uncle. And the scholars, they say, look at the way of the da'wah of the Prophet ﷺ, that he says to his uncle in this beautiful manner of respect and honor to his uncle who's older than him, his uncle, etc., he says to him, O oh my uncle, O oh my uncle, in this nice respectful manner to Abu Talib, so that he will maybe accept the da'wah. In order that Abu Talib, he will feel the emotion also from his nephew, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, when he calls him like this, in this gentle manner, O oh my uncle. So then he says to him, قُلْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ My uncle, say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Say, testify that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. Testify that there is no deity worthy of worship in truth except Allah. Say this word, believe in it, testify to it. Kalima uhaju laka biha inda Allah. This is a testimony that it will be an evidence for you, defending you on the day of judgment. This will be something that it can be used in your defense on the Day of Judgment, that you died upon Tawheed. Kalimatan uhaju laka biha inda Allah. This is something that I will be able to defend you with, that you were a believer, you died upon Tawheed. So say this word, say the shahada, utter the shahada, have the aqidah in the shahada, and die upon that. Meaning, uhaju laka biha inda Allah, that I will be able to testify on the day of judgment that you died upon Tawheed. I will be able to testify you, testify for you, that you died upon Tawheed on that day, so that you can be saved from the fire. This, the Shaykh says, is one of the ways of giving da'wah. That when you encourage somebody to perform the obedience and to be upon Tawheed, you clarify to them the benefits and the virtues of that in order to encourage them to accept it. So when you tell them about Tawheed, tell them about the virtues of Tawheed and the great benefits of Tawheed and how it protects you from the fire and enters you into paradise. 
give them those virtues to encourage them to accept Tawheed, as the Prophet ﷺ did to Abu Talib. He said to him, say the kalima, be upon Tawheed, believe in that, and I'll be able to testify for you on the day of judgment that you died as a person of Tawheed, and that will save you from the fire. So this is an encouragement for somebody to accept that. Walakin, however, when the Prophet ﷺ said this to his uncle, Obviously, as you remember, two of the mushrikeen were stood there and they could hear all of this, what was going on. So when they heard the Prophet ﷺ trying to convince his uncle Abu Talib to leave the religion of shirk and to testify to Tawheed before dying, then what did they do? They said, فَقَالَا لَهُ أَتَرْغَبُ عَن مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ They said to Abu Talib, أَتَرْغَبُ عَن مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ Meaning, they said to him, Are you going to leave the religion of Abdul al-Muttalib, your father? Are you going to leave the religion of your father? You're going to leave the religion of your father, what the, your father Abdul al-Muttalib was upon. You're going to leave that. Abdul al-Muttalib was known before the Prophet ﷺ was born, even Abdul al-Muttalib was known as one of the respected senior figures of Mecca. Abdul Muttalib was recognized and known by the people as like a leader figure, even though they didn't used to have a leader in authority like that uh, previously before. They didn't have a, 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 a leader in authority positioned, but he was recognized and looked at as one of the senior people, Abdul Muttalib. So they said to him, are you going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib, your father? You're going to abandon that? You're going to turn your back on that? This is what they began to say to him. Are you going to leave the religion of your forefather? And this was their jahiliyyah. This is the way they were. This is what the Quran says about the mushrikeen. Allah said about them in that they used to say, Inna wajadana aba'ana ala ummah. The mushrikeen they used to say, This is what we found our forefathers upon. Our fathers, they taught us this religion, they taught us this shirk. Or they don't call it shirk, but they say, this is what our forefathers, they taught us. This is what we are upon. That was their proof. They would say, this is what our fathers have taught us, and this is what we're going to do then. So they were saying the same thing to him now. You were taught by your father that religion. Are you going to leave that religion now? You're going to turn your back on the religion of your father? So they were trying to encourage him to not listen to the Prophet ﷺ and to stay upon shirk. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard them trying to do that, he then repeated it again. He said, Oh my uncle, say La ilaha illallah. He tried to encourage him again, repeated it. When the mushrikeen heard that, they repeated their thing again. Are you going to leave the religion of your forefathers? You're going to leave the religion of Abdul Muttalib? So the Prophet ﷺ replied again, and they replied again. And in the end, after hearing this, the kalima of Tawheed, to say that from the mushrikeen, to say, no, stay on your religion. Say Tawheed, no, stay on your religion. In the end, what did Abu Talib do? It's mentioned, فَكَانَ آخِرُ مَا قَال The last thing that uh, Abu Talib said before his death was, هُوَ عَلَى مِلَّةِ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ That he is upon the religion of Abd al-Muttalib. His final statement was that he's going to stay upon the religion of his father Abd al-Muttalib. وَأَبَى أَنْ يَقُولَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ And he refused to say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ with regards to Abu Talib, it is mentioned in some of the books, Ibn Kathir, he mentioned in Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, those lines of poetry that they attribute to Abu Talib, where Abu Talib he said that I know, I know that the best of all of the religions of the people is your religion, O Muhammad, Islam. I know that is the best of the religions. وَلَوْلَا مَلَامَةُ nas. And was it not for the blameworthiness, O oh, Al-Mulama, was it not for the blameworthiness of abandoning and turning my back on my father and the forefathers and the religion that they were upon, was it not for that blameworthiness that I feel, then I would have accepted Islam. 
These words, it is mentioned that they are the words of Abu Talib, that he wrote them. Uh, Ibn Kathir mentions them in Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah, and some of the scholars, they say this poetry was associated and ascribed and attributed to Abu Talib. That he said, I know the best religion is the religion of Muhammad. But was it not for the blameworthiness, the feeling of blameworthiness of abandoning my forefathers and turning my back on them, then I would have accepted Islam. So his connection to Jahiliyyah prevented him. His emotional attachment to his ignorance, of Jahiliyyah, his forefathers, that shirk, that attachment and that, that uh, nationalism, as we say now, that qawmiyyah to his tribe and to the shirk that they were upon, that stuck to him and he couldn't release himself from that and he didn't accept Islam in the end. So then, the Prophet ﷺ said, فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَأَسْتَغْفِرَنَّ لَكَ مَا لَمْ أُنْهَ عَنْكَ That I will seek forgiveness for you as long as I am not prohibited from that. I will seek forgiveness for you as long as I am not prohibited from that. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ So then the ayat were revealed. The ayah was revealed. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ That it is not for the Prophet, nor for those who believe to seek forgiveness for the mushrikeen. That is not correct for the believers to seek forgiveness for the mushrikeen. Not for the Prophet, not for the other believers, that they seek forgiveness for the mushrikeen. So we know that if a person dies upon kufr, they die upon kufr as a kafir, then you can't make dua for them for mercy, etc., that they've... Uh, once they've died upon that state, they've died upon being a kafir, then you cannot make dua for them for mercy and forgiveness. They will be in the fire forever. So here this ayah was revealed that you cannot seek forgiveness for the mushrikeen. Then the ayah was also mentioned, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ well, In fact, before we move to that, the shaykh says, the shaykh al-Fawzan, الْمُشْرِكُ لَا يَجُوزُ الْإِسْتِغْفَارُ لَهُ وَلَا التَّرَحْهُمْ عَلَيْهِ إِذَا مَاتَ عَلَى شَرْكِ it is not permissible to seek forgiveness for a mushrik. After that mushrik has died, you cannot seek forgiveness for that mushrik. Whilst they are alive, disbelievers, it's permissible to make dua for them. It's permissible to make dua for a kafir whilst he's alive. You ask Allah, oh Allah, guide my neighbor, guide this person I work with, a kafir. You can make that dua. Ask Allah to guide some of the people who may not be Muslims, to guide them to Islam. That's permissible. But after they've died now, and they've died as a kafir, you can't seek forgiveness for them now. You can't seek forgiveness for them now. You can't make dua to have mercy upon them now. They've died upon uh, being a kafir. That's it now. But when they're alive, it's permissible to make dua to Allah, guide such and such to Islam, guide such and such to Islam. So the shaykh says, that it's not permissible after the death. وَكَذَلِكَ فِي حَالَةِ الْحَيَاةِ فَالْمُشْرِكْ لَا يُسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُ وَهُوَ حي وَلَا يُتَرَحَّمُ عَلَيْهِ Even whilst a Mushrik is alive, the shaykh says, you don't seek forgiveness for him. You don't ask Allah to forgive him or to have mercy on him. Even whilst the mushrik is alive. But what you can do is ask Allah to guide him. Not the scholars they mention, Shaykh Sayyid al-Madkhari, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. He mentioned it's permissible to make dua. And other scholars have said it's permissible to make dua that Allah guides a particular kafir. But the shaykh says here, yeah, you cannot make dua for Allah to forgive them and to have mercy upon them as they are in their state of being a kafir. But you can make dua that Allah guides them. Uh, because it's not permissible to love them and to have the uh, uh, allegiance to them. Therefore, you don't seek forgiveness for them. But you can make dua that Allah guides them. So then, there's this other ayah that was revealed also. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ That you cannot guide, O Messenger, i.e. the Prophet ﷺ, you cannot guide, i.e. you do not control guidance. Who is guided and who is not guided, that is not in your control. لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ Who you love, your close family, your relatives, Abu Talib now, his own blood uncle, protected him and defended him even though he was a mushrik he protected and defended the prophet ﷺ. so the ayah says you cannot guide it's not in your control who you can guide even if they are from those who you love from your family from your relatives your uncle al muradu bil mahabba al mahabba at i.e. the people that you have the natural love for 
Because your family, let's say for example, somebody becomes a Muslim, they revert, but all of their family is not Muslim. You still love them. You have the natural love for them, the natural love. Your mother, your father, they raised you. Your brother, your sister, even if they're not believers, you have a natural type of love for them. That's permissible. But the love which goes beyond that, the love which, that goes beyond that in terms of allegiance, al-wala, al-bara, and those types of affairs which affects your own obedience, etc., that's not permissible. But naturally, you can't remove it. It's a natural love you have for your mother who raised you. Even if you become Muslim, she's still a kafira. You're going to have that natural feeling. So that's permissible, that you're not held accountable for. But it's above that when it goes beyond that natural feeling, that's when the accountability occurs. So here in the ayah it says, even those who you have the natural love for, like Abu Talib, the natural feeling, he's his own blood uncle, he protected him, he defended him. So even those uh, in the ayah it says, you cannot guide them. You do not control who is guided and who is not guided. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ But rather it is Allah who guides whom he wills. وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْتَدِينَ And Allah is the most knowledgeable regarding those who will be guided. So the Prophet ﷺ, in this ayah, Allah mentioned or negated from him the ability to guide people. So what was therefore the responsibility of the Prophet ﷺ and the other Prophets if they cannot guide people? Pass to pass the message, the tabligh. It was upon them to preach that message, to convey the message, to show the people the correct pathway, to show them where the wrong pathway is so that they avoid it, to teach them tawheed, to warn them against shirk, teach them sunnah, warn them against bid'ah. That was the role of the prophets and messengers. That in of itself is a type of guidance. That is a type of guidance. Dalalatul irshad as the scholars they say. The guidance of showing people the right way. That's what the prophets and messengers did. They showed people the right way. This is the path to savior. This is the path to salvation. This is the path to paradise. That is the path of the shaitan to hellfire. The prophets and messengers came and taught the people that. But did everybody accept? No, they didn't. Who accepts and who doesn't accept? That isn't in the control of the prophets or the messengers. And that is not in our control. In our control, what we can do is show the people where the right path is. Then whoever accepts that, alhamdulillah, that guidance is from Allah to that person. And whoever doesn't accept it, they don't. But it's not in our control. We can't change the heart of a person and say, I'm going to make this person accept and he will accept. Maybe you won't. Maybe you sit down in a room and give da'wah to a hundred people, none of them accept. Even though you clear, clarify to them and explain to them tawheed and everything. Maybe none of them accepts. Because it's not in your control who's going to accept. So here Allah mentions it is not in the control of the Prophet ﷺ who's going to accept that guidance because that type of guidance, hidayah to tawfiq, the, the, the enlightenment of the heart, the inner guidance, that is only for Allah. That inner guidance, the enlightenment of the heart is only from Allah. That is not the prophets and the messengers who can put that into the heart of a person. They can show the people the dilala, the irshad, as we can. We can show the people that type of guidance. But the inner guidance, that is only from Allah. That's what's meant here. Inna ka la man ahbabt, that you cannot guide anybody with that inner guidance, even if they are your own family or your relatives. There is another ayah in the Quran where it says, though, wa inna ka la tahdi ila sirati mustaqim. In another ayah of the Quran, Allah says to the Prophet, ﷺ, indeed, you guide to the straight path. So now this ayah is affirming that the Prophet ﷺ guides. Whereas the ayah that we've just read before, that was saying you cannot guide. So how do you combine between the two? One ayah is saying you cannot guide the people. The other one is saying you are the one who guides the people to the straight path. So which one is it? How do we understand? We just mentioned it now. There's two types of guidance. One is the, the outer guidance. You show them the correct way. You show them sunnah. You show them tawheed. Show them all of that guidance. That is the one that's been talking about in this second ayah. That you guide the people to the straight path. I.e. you show them that revelation, you pass that on, you convey that. That is showing them that path to the straight pathway. The second, the uh, initial, the first guidance where Allah said you cannot guide, that is talking about the inner guidance. So there's two types of guidance. The general outer guidance, which is the guidance of showing people the right way that the prophets and messengers do, that we can do, everybody can do. You can guide the people in that general way, showing them what the correct pathway is. But the inner guidance, 
That is not in our control. Will the people then accept it from you when you show them or not? That is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether they will or not. So that's what's meant here. And this is why the Shaykh said at the beginning, it's a refutation of the people who go to extremism. Because some people, they will begin to say the Prophet controls that. He controls who he guides. He has the ability to guide whoever he wants and that type of speech. So we negate that and we do not attribute these types of things to the Prophet ﷺ, which the Qur'an and the Sunnah has not attributed to him. So the Shaykh says, as Shaykh Al-Fawzan, فَنَحْنُ عَلَيْنَا الدَّعْوَى Upon us is to just give da'wah. وَهِدَايَةُ الْإِرْشَادُ وَالْإِبْلَاغِ وَالْإِبْلَاغِ نعم. And to guide the people to the correct way and to convey the message to them. أَمَّا هِدَايَةُ الْقُلُوبِ As for the guidance of the heart, the inner guidance, فَهَذِهِ بِيَدِ الله. This is in the control of Allah. لا أحد يستطيع أن يوجد الإيمان في قلب أحد إلا الله. No one is able to create iman in the heart of somebody except Allah. No one, none of us can put iman into the heart of a person. We can show them and teach them, but then it's from Allah whether that person will accept that and have that iman or not. So here, the Sheikh, to summarize the benefits of this hadith, he says, firstly. The first benefit we can take from this narration is the legislation to give da'wah. That it's a must. Da'wah must be given to the people. Here the Prophet ﷺ came uh, to his uncle and gave him da'wah even whilst his uncle was on his deathbed. The final stages of life he was still trying with him and giving him da'wah. So it's upon the believers to be patient upon that. To be patient in giving the da'wah for the one who is able, no doubt the principles are in place. Al-ilmu qabla al-qawli wal-amal. Knowledge comes before statements and actions. So the one who has some knowledge, has that ability to teach something or to give some da'wah to friends, family, then upon what you know and you studied and you're grounded in, then you can give the da'wah to that level, to your family, to your friends, to your neighbors. So that is one point of benefit from the narration. Second point of benefit the legislation to visit the ill. The legislation to visit the ill. It is from the sunnah also recommended and something mentioned in the sunnah that we have to visit the ill people. في الحديث دليل على مشروعية عيادة المريض المشرك Even if it was a mushrik. The shaykh says in the hadith there is an evidence that it is legislated to visit the ill person even if that ill person was a mushrik. But why? من أجل دعوته إلى الله to use that as an opportunity to give him da'wah to Allah, to give him da'wah to Islam. Because as the scholars, they say, when somebody's ill, you're in a state of weakness. You're not powerful and arrogant. You're weak. You're feeling the pain. You're feeling the illness. You're in a state of weakness. And therefore, in that type of state, you're more likely to accept. Because you won't have the arrogance and the ability to fight back and argue and things like that. So there's more possibility of being able to accept at that time. So uh, here it mentions visiting the mushrik. Who's ill, it's permissible if you have the ability, obviously, as we said, you have that knowledge, you have that ability to go give some da'wah to him, to go there and to use that opportunity to give some da'wah and to visit that ill person, even the mushrik. Because here the Prophet ﷺ visited his uncle who was a mushrik and he gave him the da'wah. Thirdly, the Shaykh says, the Shaykh al uh, that whomsoever says La ilaha illallah testifies to that. Then it is accepted from him and we rule upon that person uh, as being Muslim. As long as nothing comes from that person which opposes it. So here, if Abu Talib had said that testimony, testified to it, then it would have been accepted that he died upon Islam. That would have been the ruling. So the Shaykh says, this is important to note, أَنَّ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ The one who says it, testifies to it, فَإِنَّهُ يُقْبَلُ مِنْهُ Then we have to accept it from him. وَيُحْكَمُ بِإِسْلَامِهِ And the ruling is given upon him that he's upon Islam. مَا لَمْ يَظْهَرْ مِنْهُ مَا يُنَاقِذُ هَذِي الْكَلِمَةِ As long as nothing uh, comes from him, appears from him, which opposes the shahada from his statements or his actions, مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَفِعْلٍ فَإِنْ ظَهَرَ مِنْهُ مَا يُنَاقِذُ هَذِي الْكَلِمَةِ حُكْمَ بِرِدَّتِهِ If something then appears from that person which uh, uh, is a nullifier of tawheed, then you can rule upon him with apostasy. But as long as nothing occurs of that nature, then we rule upon that person that he is a Muslim. In his heart, does he have that yaqeen? Does he have that sidq? Does he have that ikhlas? The sincerity, the, the certainty, the uh, truthfulness, those types of affairs, does he have them in his heart or not? That's beyond our knowledge. That is between him and Allah. And that's why even the munafiqeen at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they were treated as believers, on the apparent and the open. So, 
إِنْ كَانَ صَادِقًا فيما بينه وبين الله. Whether he's truthful or not, that's between him and Allah. As for what we see from him, then we see from him that he's Muslim now, that he's testified to that. The fourth affair which can be benefited from this hadith is that your conclusion, what you die upon, that's what will be the key factor. Here Abu Talib lived a life of kufr, disbelief, mushrik. But if he had accepted tawheed at that final stage, then he would have been a Muslim upon death, and the ruling upon him would have been the ruling of Islam, and he would have been in paradise. So even if a person accepts the shahada at the very last moment in their life, then the ruling will be upon that, that they died upon tawheed and they died upon Islam. So the shaykh says, Al-A'mal bil khawatim That your actions are by what they are sealed with, the final action. So Abu Talib, the shaykh says, he lived upon kufr and shirk. But had he said La ilaha illallah at the time of death, لو قال لا إله إلا عند الوفاء واستجاب للرسول لخط لختم له بالإسلام. If he had answered, he had agreed to La ilaha illallah, accepted that, testified to it, then the ruling would have been given. He died as a Muslim, and that's just like the hadith. وإن أحدكم لا يعمل بعمل أهل الجنة حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل النار فيدخلها. That one of you, maybe you do the actions of the people of paradise all of your life, you're upon righteousness and piety. But then at the end you do something which is shirk and you die as a mushrik in the hellfire. And maybe somebody all their life they live upon shirk, but at the end of their life they die upon tawheed, accept it, they'll be in paradise. So that ending is of great importance and that's why the Prophet ﷺ always used to make dua. يَا مُقَلِّبَ الْقُلُوبِ ثَبِّتْ قَلْبِ عَلَى دِينِكَ Oh, the one who changes the hearts of the people, keep my heart firm upon your religion. And he said to Aisha radiallahu anha that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all of the hearts of the people between his two fingers, changes them as he wills. So how can I feel secure and safe? So you make dua to Allah always that your heart is not changed away from this guidance and that you are kept firm upon it. Another benefit from this narration is to be warned from evil company. To warn you from having evil company, bad company, people who are not practicing, people who don't care about the religion, because they will influence you. Look what happened to Abu Talib. Those two mushrikeen who were there from his companions, they came to him and in the end, with their speech, they influenced him to stay upon kufr. So the shaykh says one of the benefits is don't accompany the evil people. Don't accompany those who are not practicing, those who don't care about the religion, those who are upon sinning and disobedience, because they will influence you. So stick with the righteous people and you'll be influenced in the righteous way. Stick with the evil people, you'll be influenced in the evil way. Also there is a refutation in this hadith upon people who claim that Abu Talib died as a Muslim. You probably heard this before. Many of the Sufis and those types of people, they say that Abu Talib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, from the family of the Prophet ﷺ, how can you say he died as a kafir? They say he died as a Muslim. The Shaykh says, في الحديث رد على من زعم إسلام أبي طالب من الشيعة والخرافيين. This is a refutation upon the people who claim that Abu Talib died as a Muslim. حديث بخاري مسلم. The final thing he said was he's upon the religion of his forefathers, upon عبد المطلب the Shirk. So this is a refutation upon those people from the Shia, some of them, and some of the other people of distortion and deviation who claim that he died upon. The religion of Islam. In reality, he died upon the religion of Kufr. He died upon Shirk. And there's one now, maybe you've heard of him. This individual, Ibrahim Osiyafi. Maybe you heard of him. This Sufi from Liverpool. He claims the same thing. Abu Talib died upon Islam. And he mentions this opinion to the people and he talks about these types of things. So the Shaykh said, this is a refutation of those types of people who have these distortions in their belief. Also, this hadith gives a very important point, which is the definition of La ilaha illallah. Abu Talib and the mushrikeen knew what the definition of La ilaha illallah is. They knew, Abu Talib knew, that if he testified to La ilaha illallah, it would have to mean that he has to abandon all of the other deities and the false gods. They knew that. And that's why he didn't do it in the end. He said, how can I abandon the religion of my forefathers? How can I turn my back on the gods that they used to worship? He knew, they knew the meaning of La ilaha illallah is to worship Allah alone and to abandon all of the other false deities. So this was known to them. And it was known to Abu Jahl. 
فدل على أن أبا جهل أفهم منهم بمعنى لا إله إلا الله أبو جهل knew the meaning of لا إله إلا الله he knew that if Abu Talib said that it would mean abandoning all of the other deities that they are worshipping so they knew that understanding and that meaning also from the benefits of the hadith that you cannot make istighfar seeking forgiveness for the disbelievers even whilst they're alive uh, and particularly after their death and that, as we mentioned, so the scholars have said, you can ask Allah to guide a particular individual to Islam, but you don't seek forgiveness for them or seek mercy for them. And the tenth benefit that the Shaykh mentions is to be warned from having blind allegiance to people. Ta'assub. The Shaykh says to be warned from having blind allegiance to people. Saying, but oh my dad and my grandfather and my uncles, we all go pray at that mosque and everybody, we've been taught this way all our lives. So what if you've been taught all that way all your lives? Look at the proofs and the evidences. The proofs and the evidences. People were upon Christianity and Judaism and other religions all their life. But they looked and they saw. And Allah guided their hearts and they came to Islam. So don't just say, oh my family, my uncles, my fathers, we all go to that mosque and we all celebrate the birthday of the Prophet every year. How can I just leave that now? Because you have to look at the Quran and the Sunnah follow the evidences. So if the evidences come to you and they are clear to you and you understand this is wrong, then stop doing it. Even if your forefathers and everybody has been doing it. So the Shaykh says, don't blindly follow. Don't just blindly follow your people and your fathers and your, 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 your nationality and whoever. Don't blindly follow the people and be attached to what they do. Because they'll misguide you if you do that. You'll end up being misguided if you blindly just follow what everybody tells you and what the customs are. Look to the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. Look at what the revelation is preaching to you in, our, in order to understand the reality of what you're supposed to be practicing. That is what we'll conclude. That is the end of the chapter. And next time, insha'Allah ta'ala, we'll begin the next chapter next week, which is Bab ma ja'a fi anna sabab kufri bani adam wa tarki him deenahum huwa al-ghulu fi salihin. That one of the reasons, the chapter which will explain one of the reasons why people became kuffar, why people are, are, are disbelievers, and that is their exaggeration and their extremism with regards to righteous people. Like you see now some of the Sufis and things, how they talk about their Imams and their scholars, and they say our Imams go to paradise at night and all these types of things. So he's going to explain about this having exaggeration and extremism to the Imams and to these righteous people as they claim, and the Peer as they call them. So those types of things are going to be discussed in the next chapter, inshallah, next week at 8 p.m. If there's any questions we're able to take, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll conclude there. I want to ask, um, you know, I have a, I have a friend that's um, in a quite severe state with cancer. And uh, the doctor told him, you know, he's going to, you know, Allah will let know how long left, but he said in a short, very short amount of time. Mm. So someone told me that you should advise him with the shahada, and you know, people will see him. Is that, is, is, this, is that correct? Or He's Muslim. He is Muslim, yeah. But obviously, is it, is it something that you have to keep um, re- reminding them of the Shahada at the time of the death, or is that...? It's, uh, it's mentioned about the time of death, but this is before death yet. Now he's just ill, he's, he's ill, he's uh, with this disease, and he could die at some point, but he's not on his deathbed yet. They said this is like a week or so, I guess. Uh-huh. But still, still now then... You should uh, uh, go to him. If you're going to explain, don't just g- exp- just say to him to say shahada, but give him explanation. Clarify to him, even in these final moments of his life, to have an understanding of that tawheed properly. So he dies upon the actual tawheed and understanding it. Is he a person of that nature or is he, he doesn't know? He doesn't know. So uh, to, uh, do that now then. So in this opportunity now, go to him to actually explain to him and give him some benefits and understanding of what shahada is, what tawheed is. So he dies upon that correct understanding, especially in this type of state now, he will be even more likely to accept the knowledge which comes to him. So use the opportunity to teach him and to explain to him the basics of the tawheed, the reality of it, so that he dies understanding that and knowing that and accepting that. So we'll leave it there. We'll carry next week, inshallah.